Sir. Ron? Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Gregory Vadis, Chief of the FCC's Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. Thank you for joining us again today at today's uh, webinar aimed at state and local governments. My office is here for state and local governments that want to speak to us about issues concerning communication services that impact you, or we're simply here just to reach out to us to help you better understand FCC's rules, programs, and policies. Our first webinar uh, began back in 2011, and our audience has uh, been growing ever since then, thanks to your registration for these events that helps grow our distribution list. So even if you just plan to watch today's webinar via FCC's live stream, I encourage you to go to the home page, click on the event, and then take the time and please register for, uh, for the event via WebEx. The registration information is all there. That way we can capture your email and provide you with updates throughout the years on important commission items that impact you and uh, notify you that you have an opportunity to weigh in on uh, a lot of these rulemakings. I know um, a lot of you have other items in your portfolio other than communications. Uh, I am proud to sit before you today to moderate today's webinar where we'll discuss two recent historic commission items. These items both help ensure our country's continued leadership in the innovation economy that takes place each and every day in each and every state and locality throughout the country. Um, the first of these items uh, deals with community broadband. It is a commission order granting the City of Wilson, North Carolina's and the Electric Board of Chattanooga, Tennessee's petitions for preemption of certain Challenges, challenge provisions of Tennessee and North Carolina law restricting municipal provision of broadband services. Essentially, the state laws had effectively prevented the cities from expanding broadband service outside their current footprints, despite numerous requests from neighboring unserved and underserved communities. In short, the Commission found that pursuant to Section 706 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996, certain aspects of the state Laws are barriers to broadband infrastructure, investment, threat competition, and conflict with the FC's mandate to promote these goals. Uh, we have a, a speaker uh, on, on that topic who will get into the details. The next of these is um, the Open Internet Order. I'm sure uh, you've all been reading about this. The Open Internet Order preserves and protects the Internet for all Americans. We heard from startups and world-leading tech companies. We heard from ISPs, large and small. We heard from public interest groups and public policy think tanks. We heard from state and local governments and associations representing them. We heard from mem members of Congress and also the President. Most importantly, we heard from 4 million Americans throughout all, throughout all states and localities that overwhelmingly spoke up in favor of preserving a free and open Internet. The open Internet order implements a bright line rule to ban blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization or fast lanes. And for the first time, these rules fully apply to mobile communications. These rules are guided by three principles. Um, the Internet must be fast, fair, and open for all. The last of these items on uh, today's webinar deals with effective competition. Um, it's it's an NPRM that seeks comment on how the Commission should improve the effective competition for franchises. So I know that's an item near and dear to all your hearts out there as uh, franchisees. Specifically, it asked whether we should adopt a rebuttable presumption that cable operators are subject to effective competition. Um, so let me, without further ado, let our Commission experts get into the items. Uh, Daniel Kahn, uh, Deputy uh, Chief in the FCC's Wireline Competition Bureau in the Policy Division, will speak to our municipal broadband or community broadband item, and he'll get into the legal nitty-gritty. And uh, please, you could uh, e email us questions via WebEx or, or, um, or email to the live stream, and as well as uh, tweet and um, send us questions via Facebook. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg, and it's my pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. As Greg said, my name is Daniel Kahn, and I am Deputy Division Chief of the FCC's Wireline Competition Bureau. 
I'll be talking today about the FCC's Tennessee and North Carolina municipal broadband preemption decisions from February. Um, I will be focused on describing the decisions um, out of an abundance of caution, I should say, however, that any views expressed are my own and not necessarily those of the agency. So to first to provide an overview, on February 26, 2015, by a three to two vote of the FCC's commissioners, the Federal Communications Commission preempted certain challenge provisions of Tennessee and North Carolina law restricting the provision of municipal broadband service. Um, the FCC found that the state laws are barriers to broadband infrastructure investment and thwart competition contrary to Section 706 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Uh, the petitioners who brought the petitions to the FCC were the Electric Power Board of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Wilson, North Carolina. Um, we'll next go over in detail the FCC's legal authority to act under Section F706 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996, the petitioners and their services, the FCC's conclusions, and then there will be some time for questions. Under Section 706 has two key provisions. We'll go over each. As my colleague Claude Aiken, who will be talking to you about the open internet, may mention, uh, the Verizon Court interpreted Section 706 to grant the FCC substantive authority. So first, Section 706A directs the FCC to encourage the deployment of advanced telecommunications capabilities, and what that term means is essentially high-speed broadband. Um, so it directs the FCC to encourage the deployment of that on a reasonable and timely basis to all Americans by utilizing uh, essentially measures that promote competition and measures that remove barriers to in infrastructure investment. The second of the two provisions, Section 706B of the Telecommunications Act, um, says that the FCC needs to annually evaluate whether advanced te telecommunications capability is being deployed to all Americans in a reasonable and timely fashion. Uh, the January 2015 Broadband Progress Report concluded that advanced telecommunications capability is not being deployed to Americans in a reasonable and timely fashion. And if the FCC reaches that conclusion, Section 706B requires it to take immediate action to accelerate the deployment of advanced telecommunications capability by removing barriers to investment and promoting competition in the telecommunications market. Next, we'll talk about the two petitioners who brought this proceeding to us. We'll start with the Electric Power Board of Chattanooga, Tennessee. EPB offers voice, video, and high-speed broadband service with speeds up to one gigabit per second to available to 170,000 customers in its electric service territory. EPB um, began with deploying fiber optic system in 1996 to meet future electrical needs and serve customers. This was so it could display a smart grid in addition to broadband. And in 2010, it became the first provider in the whole country to offer one gigabit per second service to all, make it available, that is, to all of its customers. Um, next, we'll talk about the restrictive Tennessee law that was challenged. And the Tennessee law, in particular, was a geographic restriction um, that prevented EPB and other municipal electrics from offering broadband or video anywhere outside of their respective electrical service areas. Um, and next we'll go over um, some of the differences between broadband in EPB service area and outside of that service area. And first we'll look at this uh, chart, um, which shows um, housing units with access to multiple providers at three megabits per second up, down, and 768 up. And this compares the national average to the Tennessee counties that are neighboring EPB service area. The reason we're looking at those is that's the area that EPB has said it would be interested in expanding to that was blocked off by the Tennessee law. And the reason we're looking at this particular speed is that um, under earlier FCC broadband progress reports prior to 2015, this was the uh, standard that the FCC applied for advanced telecommunications capability. And you can see that the areas around EPB um, that can't get its service are quite a bit worse off than the national average. For instance, three times as many people have access to no providers at this speed, and almost half in EPB's area have 
access to at most one. I should note that um, the data presented here does not include mobile or satellite. Um, we'll also look at 25.3, which is the current standard, and you can see, again, it's the same result. The areas into which EPB would like to expand but hasn't been able to are quite a bit worse off than the national average. Notably, only 5% of people have access to two or more providers at 25.3. Um, next, we will talk about the other petitioner, Wilson, North Carolina. Um, Wilson offers, like EPB, Wilson is an electric service provider, and it offers electric service in six counties in North Carolina. Um, after Wilson attempted to approach local incumbents to improve their service but was rebuffed, in 2005 it built a fiber backbone connecting city-owned facilities and then began launched its broadband service under the trade name Greenlight in 2008. In 2013, um, like EPB, Wilson began offering residential one gigabit per second service. Uh, the North Carolina law is a bit more complicated than the Tennessee law. Unlike the Tennessee law, which is just a geographic restriction, the North Carolina law contains um, numerous restrictions. It was enacted in 2011, and the record the commission found suggested that it was largely sponsored and lobbied for by incumbent providers. And it includes a variety of um, provisions um, that the FCC concludes. It categorizes them and concludes that they uh, raise economic costs of municipal broadband. Um, there are some quote-unquote level playing field obligations that purport to level the playing field between municipal providers and private entities and measures to impose delay on the municipal provision of broadband. Um, we'll look at next... Um, broadband speeds in North Carolina. It's, this is the same as the information that we saw about Tennessee. It compares the areas in North Carolina into which um, Wilson would like to expand to the national average. And again, you can see the areas in North Carolina are quite a bit worse off in terms of broadband availability. Um, and this is at 3768. Uh, here's the data at 25.3. And again, here it's striking that only 3% of people have access to two or more providers at 25 megabits per second down, 3 megabits per second up. Next, we'll talk about some of the factors that the commission considered in reaching its decision. Um, for instance, it looked at some of the benefits of EPBs and Wilson's service. Um, and, for example, in terms of economic benefits, Wilson provides free Wi-Fi to its entire downtown area. Um, in terms of jobs, a study of EPB showed um, that it had helped to create 3,716 net jobs as of 2011, including businesses such as Amazon and Volkswagen. Uh, Mozilla, in terms of education, Mozilla just awarded the Chattanooga Library a grant for the creation of an enhanced so-called gigabit lab, and the New York Public Library, the largest public library in the country, recently announced it is looking to the Chattanooga's Public Library as a model for renovation of its library facilities with high-tech collaborative spaces. And as an example of other public safety benefits, Wilson's fiber network has facilitated the deployment of more than 30 public safety cameras in the city. Um, another example of benefits is positive competitive responses in Wilson, Chattanooga, and elsewhere. Um, meaning that when municipal broadband providers have entered those markets, the existing private providers in the market have reduced rates or halt, rate, halted rate increases, particularly in comparison to surrounding areas, and improved service. Um, there's when at least one case we're aware of in which a, in a community simply conducted a feasibility study about providing broadband, and in response to that, the incumbent service provider accelerated improvements budgeted for later years, and significantly improved its circuit and also began expansion of service to parts of the county that were not previously served. Um, so as I said earlier, the FCC reached the conclusion under Section 706 that preemption meets the standard for action because it removes barriers to overall broadband infrastructure investment and promotes overall competition in the telecommunications market in Tennessee and North Carolina. Among other factors relevant to the FCC's decision uh, were 
that EPB and Wilson and other municipal broadband providers in those two states provide service because the pre-existing service didn't meet community needs either in terms of speed of service or the other needs of the community. Um, private providers, as I mentioned earlier, in Chattanooga and Wilson um, improved services and reduced rates or halted rate increases in response to municipal entry. And um, the FCC rejected a number of je objections in the record, including um, so-called level playing field and crowding ar out arguments and claims that EPB, Wilson, and other municipalities are likely to fail. Um, just to expand on a few of those points, in terms of uh, what community needs, the FCC said, the decisions by EPB and Wilson to invest in broadband were driven by, among other factors, a desire to improve service beyond levels of investment in the same communities by private sector and entities. The investment and deployment exemplifies why preemption removes barriers to overall broadband infrastructure investment and promotes overall broadband competition in Tennessee and North Carolina. The level playing field argument that the FCC rejected is the idea that municipal competition is unfair to private sector competitors. And the related crowding out idea is the idea that it will diminish private investment. In some cases, it's argued that it would do so in an inefficient manner. Um, uh, the FCC, uh, the claims that some systems would, are likely to fail, some of those focused on EPB and Wilson specifically, some on other systems in the two states, and some are more general. And again, the FCC rejected these arguments. The FCC also conducted a detailed analysis of state law. Um, it analyzed the specific impact of the challenge Tennessee and North Carolina laws, and it concluded that the Tennessee geographic restriction and most, though not all, of the challenged portions of the North Carolina law serve as barriers to broadband infrastructure investment and competition. Um, some provisions of the North Carolina law, like some statutory definitions and accounting requirements, the FCC did not preempt. Um, and to give a little bit more color to the North Carolina law, uh, it's pretty, there's quite a bit to it, so I'm not going to be able to cover the whole thing. But one category of provisions that the FCC preempted evaluating holistically are measures to raise economic costs. And these included a ter uh, the, uh, the same territorial restriction prohibiting expansion that we mentioned earlier. Um, and although it had limited exceptions, the FCC concluded that those do not provide a meaningful way for municipalities to expand. A provision requiring the payment, of payment in lieu of taxes equivalent to what a private sector provider would pay. And finally, the imputation of the cost of capital available to provide private providers and all taxes and regulatory fees that would apply to a private competitor and a prohibition on charging below that cost so that, for example, a municipal provider could not provide the same discount that a below-cost discount for new customers that a private sector company would be able to provide. Um, last, the FCC evaluated its authority to preempt under Section 706. It concluded that Section 706 authorizes it to preempt state laws that specifically regulate broadband provision by the state's political subdivision, where those laws stand as barriers to broadband infrastructure investment and competition. The FCC stated that a different question would be presented if the FCC were asked to preempt state laws that withhold authority to provide broadband altogether. However, the laws at issue, quote, serve as state law communications policy regulations as opposed to a core state function in controlling political subdivisions. Um, two notes about the scope of the decision. It applies, although it was the petition was brought at the behest of, and the FCC evaluated these questions at the behest of Wilson and EPB, these, the decision applies to Tennessee and North Carolina. However, it does not apply to any other states. Um, many of you may have seen in the news that the state of Tennessee has filed an appeal in the Sixth Circuit, so our story is not done. And I want to close with a quote from the, intergovernment, the FCC's Intergovernmental Advisory Committee. Uh, to be clear, this is not a part of the FCC's decision or a rationale that was endorsed by the FCC, um, or not endorsed it, uh, one way or the other, but I thought it was relevant to share um, the IAC's view, given the role of the IAC in, um, and the composition of this audience, 
and what IIC said is the communities should have the right and discretion to promote the deployment of broadband networks in any way they deem appropriate, whether that be providing service, creating public-private partnerships, or developing incentives for private sector investment. And with that, I thank you very much. And if there are any questions before we have to move on to our next presentation, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, we'll give questions a minute uh, or so to come in. And uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, Daniel and I have been out uh, to some of the state and local government organization meetings uh, here in town, and we've heard from many of you um, how important this decision is to you. Again, can't, um, the scope of the the scope of the uh, the preemption petition order only applies to those states, um, as other as other localities submit uh, petitions. We'll look at them on a case by case basis. So it's not a it's not a, a sweeping order that automatically applies to 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 all um, localities in all states. Uh, I don't I don't see any questions coming in. I know we must have a lot of folks out there. Uh, as they come in, or if they come in a little late, we'll get we'll get them over to Daniel, and we thank him for his time and expertise in discussing um, uh, this really important order to to all of you out there. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Great. Let's give us a second to get settled. Next up is the open internet order, uh, something that's just gotten a little bit of press around here and uh, throughout the country. We were lucky to have uh, Claude Aiken today. He's the deputy chief of the Competition Policy Division in the Wireline Bureau. Um, Claude is going to talk to you about the ins and outs of the um, open internet order. Um, we really appreciate his time, given that the open internet order and the accompanying statements are about 400 pages. So uh, I should also mention that after the webinar, the PowerPoints will be up uh, on the web page as well. And um, I, I, I think uh, Claude's uh, summary um, will really be helpful to everybody out there. So thanks, Claude. Thanks, Greg, and uh, thanks, everybody, uh, for being here today. I'm here to... As Greg said, give a brief uh, overview of uh, the Commission's open Internet item and hopefully to uh, reserve enough time to answer any questions if, if there are any. Um, is the, are the slides? Oh, the slides. Oh. Okay. Uh, excellent. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so let's get going. Um, the Open Internet Order is the culmination of more than a decade of effort by the Commission to adopt rules and policies to ensure uh, consumers have unfettered access to lawful content on the Internet. Um, for the Commission, it was uh, never a question of whether to have rules to protect a free and open Internet, but how. The how of enacting open internet rules and the reason we have been working on this issue for more than a decade is uh, wrapped up in the arcana of U.S. law and court challenges to commission decisions, which I'll get into later in the presentation. Uh, the reason why the commission was so persistent in crafting open internet rules in the face of multiple court challenges is that the commission is committed to protecting and promoting an internet that nurtures freedom of speech and expression, uh, supports innovation and commerce, and incentivizes expansion and investment by broadband providers. The Commission found in its order that broadband providers have economic incentives that could undermine these goals, that clear enforceable rules are therefore necessary to protect an open Internet. The order is grounded on the principle that no actor, government or private, uh, should interfere with the full lawful use of the Internet. The rules adopted in the order protect this principle by keeping Internet access open and neutral, not by regulating the Internet. The same principle was first articulated by the Commission in 2004 under Chairman Powell and was reconfirmed through two administrations and four FCC chairmen. 
So moving on to the open Internet rules. Uh, they apply to mass market retail broadband Internet access services. That is, to the services ISPs provide consumers to access content on the Internet, not the Internet, uh, the content applications or devices itself. Uh, while the FCC's 2010 Open Internet rules had limited applicability to mobile broadband, the new rules in their entirety would apply to fixed and mobile broadband alike, recognizing advances in technology and the growing significance of wireless broadband access in recent years. In the order, the Commission found that uh, broadband Internet access service is a telecommunications service, and this is uh, where we get into the arcana of how the the our Communications Act is structured. Under uh, the Communications Act, services are uh, essentially either telecommunications services or information services. If they are telecommunications services, they are subject to the rules under what is called uh, Title II of the Communications Act, the section applying to common carriers. In the past, the Commission has classified broadband Internet access as an information service. In 2010, the Commission adopted open Internet rules based on this classification. Uh, early last year, the courts found that the Commission had the legal authority to adopt open Internet rules, but that the specific rules we adopted were not permitted under the classification of broadband Internet access as an information service. In its decision last month, the Commission relied on multiple sources of legal authority in our statute, including classifying broadband Internet access service as a telecommunications service under Title II to provide the strongest possible legal foundation for our rules. I'll now provide a summary of the rules the Commission adopted. Um, there are three bright line rules. No blocking. Um, broadband for providers may not block access to legal content, application services, or non-harmful devices. Uh, the no throttling rule. Broadband providers may not impair or degrade lawful Internet traffic on the basis of content, application services, or non-harmful devices. And no paid prioritization. Uh, by this, we mean that broadband providers may not favor some lawful Internet traffic over other lawful Internet uh, lawful traffic in exchange for consideration of any kind. In other words, no fast lanes. This rule also bans ISPs from prioritizing content and services of their affiliates. Other than paid prioritization, the rules are subject to recognition that an ISP may engage in reasonable network management to take into account the technical and engineering aspects of their networks. Paid prioritization is a business decision, not a network management decision, so the network management exception does not apply to the paid prioritization rule. In assessing reasonable network management, the Commission standard takes account of the particular engineering attri attri attributes of technology involved, whether it be fiber, DSL, cable, unlicensed Wi-Fi, mobile, or another network medium. However, the network practice must be primarily used for and tailored to achieving a legitimate network management and not business purpose. The Commission also adopted a general conduct rule to address situations where conduct may not violate one of the three bright line rules, but still interferes with consumers' access to lawful content on the Internet. This general conduct rule establishes that ISPs cannot unreasonably interfere with or unreasonably disadvantage the ability of consumers to select, access, and use the lawful content, applications, services, or devices of their choosing, or edge providers to make lawful content, applications, services, or devices available to consumers. The Commission will address complaints about such practices on a case-by-case -case basis. The Commission also enhanced the Open Internet Transparency Rule, which had been upheld by the Court in its decision last year. The original rule, which the Commission reaffirmed, requires broadband Internet access service providers to publicly disclose information regarding the network management practices, performance, and commercial terms of their offerings. In the recent Open Internet Order, the Commission expanded on those transparency requirements, mandating that providers disclose promotional rates, fees, and surcharges, and data caps, as well as more detailed information about network performance. The Commission made clear that ISPs should not be able to evade their open Internet obligations via the provision of data services that do not go over the public Internet, services that the Commission formally denominated as specialized services. Examples of such services include VoIP from a cable system, uh, dedicated heart monitoring service, smart cars, 
they are not broadband internet access services because they are they are not provided over the public internet and therefore are not covered by the open internet rules. However, the order also ensures that these services are not used to undermine the effectiveness of the open internet rules. The commission stated that it will keep a close eye on the practices of broadband internet access providers to ensure that data services do not become a loophole that allows these providers to circumvent the open internet rules. The commission expressly found in the order that it has jurisdiction over the exchange of traffic between mass market broadband providers and other networks and services. As the commission noted, the representation to consumers that they will be able to make to access lawful content on the internet includes the promise to make the interconnection arrangements necessary to allow that access. However, the Commission concluded that it does not have sufficient experience with internet traffic exchange to intervene in the market and apply prescriptive rules. So the open, the open internet rules, the three bright line rules, and the general conduct rule will not apply to internet traffic exchange. Instead, the Commission will apply an approach of watch, learn, and act, subject to an ability to act on a case-by-case -case basis under Title II. Now, as I mentioned previously, uh, the reclassification of broadband internet access service under Title II um, without further action by the Commission would have subjected the service to many of the other provisions of uh, Title II. Um, the Commission in this order forbore from many of those provisions, including those dealing with rate regulation, tariffing and unbundling, uh, the kind of provisions typically associated with uh, utility, utility regulation. However, the, uh, the order specifically retained um, sections 201 and 202 and 208, uh, related enforcement authority, um, sort of the, the bedrock principles that allow the commission to, to act in these instances. It also retained um, provisions in four specific subcategories, uh, including privacy, uh, poll attachments, and uh, universal service and disabilities access. However, the Commission did forbear from the requirements in sections uh, 225 or 254 that would have triggered mandatory uh, USF or TRS contribution as of the date of the order. I just wanted to uh, finish up with some issues in the order that may be of particular interest to the state and local folks who are listening in on this webinar. Uh, the order says that uh, states themselves are bound by the forbearance decisions in the order. Um, the order also does reaffirm uh, the Commission's prior findings that this service is jurisdictionally interstate for regulatory purposes. Um, it also notes that as a result of the, the reclassification of the service that it is not, this is not a basis for uh, requiring a cable system to obtain a new franchise or renegotiate an existing franchise. Um, like at the federal level where there are no mandatory uh, USF contributions that flow as a result of this order, uh, states are similarly prohibited from assessing it as a result of this order. Um, and the or order also states that uh, it will um, look closely at uh, state regulation of broadband internet access services and um, it may step in and, and preempt where it finds that there is uh, inconsistent state regulation. Um, thank you all for listening and um, open it up to any questions that may be coming in at this time. Now is your chance. Um, uh, Claude knows the order inside and out. Uh, he was one of the attorneys that uh, helped uh, draft the order um, and helped uh, craft it. So I uh, can't believe uh, we don't have any questions or uh, slings and arrows to be <laughs> uh, thrown at Claude. Now, in all seriousness, this is a, a great chance. Um, if you don't want to send it in on live questions, you could uh, also email them to us, um, and we could get Claude to answer them offline. Again, his PowerPoint will be up. Um, 
think it's very useful in distilling some 300 pages of uh, legalese and getting it down hopefully to the nitty nitty gritty for you guys. Um, I guess if we don't have any questions, without uh, we'll uh, move on to our um, to our next topic, which uh, actually the end of Claude's presentation makes a, a, a nice lead into dealing with um, uh, cable with uh, cable franchises with our um, French with our um, states and localities that are franchisees or that hold the cable that have the franchise. Thanks, Greg. Oh, wait. Oh, we made one question. We have one that just came in. It's uh, pretty specific. I don't know if uh, Claude will know this offhand. It comes uh, from our uh, friends in uh, Fairfax County, right across the river. Their um, their uh, Department of Cable and Consumer uh, Services Division. Uh, what is the basis in the comments for the statement regarding state and local franchise requirements? Uh, foot, it looks like footnote 1258. So I. <laughs> I can't speak specifically to this at this time. I, I think if you if you've already gone down to the footnote in the order, you probably have uh, got a pretty good sense of what the commission has has said on this. And I I don't think I can. I'm not a cable franchising expert, so I, I can't really speak beyond what the commission has said in the order at, at this time. Okay. Thanks. Well, we have we have another uh, question that just came in. How long will it, before, be, will it be before state and federal USF levies will be applied to the Internet users' broadband bills? Uh, well, So, again, the, as, as I mentioned, the commission forbore from the uh, mandatory contributions in the Act. Uh, what any future commission may decide to do is sort of beyond the the scope of what I can, what I can talk to today. Um, so um, unfortunately, I think I'm going to have to leave it leave it at that as well. And I, I think if you go to um, the FCC, if you go to that open internet page, there's uh, the press release also uh, goes down and enumerates all the provisions of Title II, uh, which uh, traditional utility type regulation that we are forbearing from on the, on the uh, internet and it's a whole I, host I will of also say that um, in you know the the question of universal service contribution assessment is on a very much a separate track from the open internet item and uh, there's an existing referral to the joint board on universal services so um, we're waiting to see what they what they come back with as well Okay. Well, questions are coming in now. All right. Furious pace. The next one is from uh, uh, one of the uh, senior city attorneys in Durham, North Carolina. Do ISP providers have capacities that are not subject to the FCC rules through which they can provide fast lanes to those who pay? Do ISP? So I think... Uh, I mean, I, I think I'd just sort of have to reiterate what I already said. The the scope of the commission's uh, regulation here is the, the broadband Internet access service. That's the service to which all of these rules apply, including the paid prioritization uh, rule. But, uh, you know, to the extent that there may be uh, non-broadband Internet access service data services uh, that raise these same sort of fast lanes concerns. Uh, the commission has explicitly said that it'll it'll take a look at that um, and that, you know, not utilizing services other than broadband internet access services to evade the rules, uh, the commission will take a, take a pretty close look at that. I have a question that I don't think really goes to the open internet item, but I, I'll read it anyway. It's from um, Arkansas. Similar to plain old telephone lines, is there any vision to provide broadband services to residential homes? I live in a rural area where it's expensive to obtain any type of broadband service. I live a mile too far for DSL or um, other services from our incumbent providers. I think that that really goes to our last item, the, uh, the provisioning of municipal broadband. I'm not sure um, uh, if there are any state laws in, Ar in Arkansas that preempt uh, municipal broadband or not, or preempt certain restrictions on it. But, um, you know, that's something you're, you're, 
your locality could look into provisioning itself. And if there are uh, restrictions on on, on um, lo localities or municipalities providing uh, their own broadband service, they're free to petition us, just uh, like um, uh, the Electric uh, Power Board and, and City of Wilson did. So thank you for your question. And uh, that's what we're hoping to do, is get broadband out to all with these. We have a bunch more. I'll give that to you as I read it out loud. Um, when and will we see the new net neutrality rules be enforced? Uh, I get, uh, we'll leave it at that. Yeah, so this, you know, I, I can speak to sort of when the the order will will go into effect. Um, the, the rules will go into effect 60 days after the FCC publishes the order in the, the Federal Register. Um, the, the question here talks about specifically about um, wireless wireless throttling. Um, that's, that's sort of a specific instance that uh, the commission, you know, the order hasn't even gotten to, into effect yet, so we, we'll, we'll see how individual cases may be analyzed under the, the rules of the order. Um, I know that the, the FTC is looking into this particular practice, but as for what the, the commission may do about it, um, I can't really say at this time. Okay. We'll go to another open Internet question. Uh, this one comes from Eureka, California. Um, what is the process for reviewing areas of forbearance? So, I think if I if I understand the the question correctly, uh, you're sort of asking about um, areas in which the commission has forborne and you know, potentially. Un undoing forbearance. Um, there are no plans to do that at this time. The the order stands for itself, and that's you know the commission's recent findings on the on the issue. Um, the commission's required to sort of make a public interest finding in terms of when it forbears from things. So um, you know to speak as to when the commission may potentially undo some sort of forbearance, that's, that's sort of beyond the scope of um, what I'm talking about here today. Right. And again, I think that the press release uh, enumerates some of the areas where we are forbearing. Um, universal service contributions, the order does not require broadband service providers to contribute to the universal service fund. Uh, broadband service will remain exempt from state and local taxation under the Internet Tax Freedom Act. The um, uh, FCC will enforce, will enforce the open Internet rules through enforcement. And I, again, uh, as Claude uh, has stated, we can't uh, speak to what future commissions will do, but the order is pretty thorough in um, enumerating all the areas we are forbearing from. Uh, we get, let me, well, we have uh, a minute or two. I, we have some questions. Um, on our last, from our last speaker. <laughs> so let me let me see if I can answer them, and uh, while we'll, we'll we wait for some more questions come in on open internet, will citizens in an area without affordable broadband service be able to require and request this local, state, or city government to develop broadband networks under the recent FCC laws proposed? Our recent, I guess, citizens could request of their uh, local of their locality um, that they do provide municipal broadband service. Our, the, the City of um, Wilson and the City of Wilson decision and the Electric Board of Tennessee, that order preempting certain provisions of uh, state laws in Tennessee and North Carolina only apply to those states right now. So it's on a um, it's on a state-by-state -state basis as petitions come in. 
and and it, there is a little legal nitty gritty. It, it's if the states have laws that preempt certain restrictions on municipal broadband, as opposed to um, laws flat out barring municipal broadband. So uh, go ahead, go uh, talk to your um, state. Go ahead and go talk to your uh, local government leader and. Um, or leaders and uh, see see uh, you know see what they want to do see what you want to do and um, that's why we're stepping in under section 706 of the uh, Telecommunications Act of 1996 to ensure that uh, broadband is provisioned to all. Again, it's on a case by case or state by state basis, and it only uh, our decision applies where certain areas of a particular, if, if a state law has provisions that restrict municipal broadband. Thank you. We have, let me see if there are any. Uh, we have another uh, question from California. When will I be able to sign up for municipal broadband in California? Um, again, I think I, I just answered that question. Uh, 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 cities have to petition us on a uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, and it depends. I, I am not sure of the ins and outs of the uh, California law, if or if there is, I, or if there is a California law that preempts um, preempts uh, municipal broadband in the state. Do we have any more questions? Okay, I'm sure some questions will roll in for uh, Claude as our next speakers are up, but we'll be happy to get them to Claude as uh, folks out there think about them. Uh, the next item, thank you very much, Claude, for um, Thanks, your uh, presentation, um, your PowerPoint, which we'll put up on the uh, website. And if there are any further questions, please get them to me. And to the extent uh, our office isn't able to offer that, able to uh, answer them, we'll uh, direct them to uh, Claude and his colleagues in the Wireline Competition Bureau. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have a few more questions rolling in, but uh, Claude has left the room. <laughs> so uh, we'll try to answer those offline. Um, next up are uh, Diana Sokolo. Uh, she's an attorney advisor in the Media Bureau's Policy Division, and Stephen Brokart, uh, a senior uh, deputy chief in the Policy Division as well in the Media Bureau. And they're here to talk about an uh, item that affects you as regula regulators of um, cable franchises. It's, uh, it's an amendment to the Commission's rules concerning effective competition, uh, implementation of Section 111 of the Satellite Television Extension and Localism Act, otherwise known as STELA, reauthorization. Uh, I'll let you guys go. Thanks, Greg. Uh, we'll get started with a little bit of background information on effective competition before we move to uh, the specifics of what the NPRM proposed. I'll start with the definition of a franchising authority, although I know that is probably familiar to many of you listening. A franchising authority is any governmental entity empowered by federal, state, or local law to grant a cable franchise. Our effective competition requirements stem from Section 623 of the Communications Act, which permits a franchising authority to regulate basic cable rates only if the cable system is not subject to effective competition. That section defines four types of effective competition. The most relevant type for our purposes is called competing provider effective competition. And that type of effective competition exists if both parts of a two-part test are met. The first part of the test requires that the franchise area is served by at least two unaffiliated multi-channel video programming distributors, or MVPDs, each of which offers comparable video programming to at least 50% of the households in the franchise area. And the second part of the test requires that the number of households subscribing to programming services offered by MVPDs, other than the largest MVPD, must exceed 15% of households in the franchise area. 
There are three other types of effective competition that each have their own statutory tests. The first is low penetration effective competition. The second is municipal provider effective competition. And the third is local exchange carrier effective competition. I won't get into the statutory tests for those other three types of effective competition today, but if you are interested, you can find those definitions in Section 623 of the Act. If any of the four tests for effective competition is met, the franchising authority cannot regulate basic cable rates, and instead those rates are dictated by the marketplace. In 1993, the Commission adopted, implemented Section 623's effective competition provisions. It did so by adopting a presumption that cable systems are not subject to effective competition unless a cable operator makes a demonstration to the contrary. The Commission also adopted a process by which a franchising authority that wants to regulate a cable operator's basic rates files FCC Form 328 to obtain the necessary certification. A franchising authority currently can rely on a presumption of no effective competition unless it has actual knowledge to the contrary. If a cable operator wishes to prevent the franchising authority from regulating its basic service rate, that cable operator may rebut the current presumption and demonstrate that it is subject to effective competition in the area. We receive a high volume of these cable operator effective competition petitions. On the day the NPRM was released, we had approximately 58 of those petitions pending. The Commission adopted the NPRM in this proceeding on March 16, 2015, seeking comment on ways to improve the effective competition process. The NPRM asks whether the Commission should adopt a rebuttable presumption that cable systems are subject to competing provider effective competition based on the significant changes we've seen in the video marketplace since 1993. The NPRM focuses largely on the ubiquitous presence of video service from DBS providers, DirecTV and Dish Network, and it provides a, a great deal of statistics on that. The NPRM also explains that the Media Bureau has found a lack of effective competition in fewer than half a percent of the communities evaluated since the start of 2013, which might indicate that the current presumption of uh, no effective competition is not the most efficient approach. The NPRM asks if the new approach would be less burdensome for cable operators, including small operators, since fewer effective competition determinations would come before the Commission. It also asks how we could mitigate the burdens that may result for franchising authorities, in particular small franchising authorities. The NPRM also addresses Section 111 of the Stella Reauthorization Act of 2014, which we refer to as Stellar. Among many other things, that statute directs the Commission to adopt a streamlined effective competition process for small cable operators. The NPRM asks whether adopting the presumption of competing provider effective competition would fulfill Section 111 by establishing a streamlined process for all cable operators, including small ones. In the alternative, the NPRM asks if Section 111 requires the Commission to adopt some other streamlined effective competition procedures for small cable operators. And if so, it asks what those procedures should be. The NPRM seeks comment on potential new procedures that would apply if the Commission adopts a presumption of competing provider effective competition. For example, a franchising authority that wants to regulate basic cable rates could continue to file FCC Form 328, the existing certification request form, but that form could be revised to require a demonstration that competing provider effective competition does not exist in the franchise area, despite the new presumption to the contrary. A cable operator could oppose this certification by filing a petition for reconsideration. We already have existing rules that govern such petitions. A cable operator opposing could either disagree with the franchising authority as to the presence of competing provider effective competition, or it could assert that one of the other three types of effective competition is present. The Media Bureau then would issue a ruling. 
The NPRM seeks comment on how the Commission should address currently certified franchising authorities if the new presumption is adopted. The NPRM asks whether these certifications should be administratively revoked because their reliance on the presumption of no effective competition would no longer be supportable. A franchising authority then could file a new certification under the new presumption if it wishes to regulate rates. In addition, the NPRM asks how the Commission should address pending cable operator effective competition petitions if the new presumption is adopted. The NPRM asks whether these petitions should be granted or whether they should be adjudicated on the merits under the new presumption of competing provider effective competition. The NPRM was published in the Federal Register on March 20th. Comments will be due on April 9th, and reply comments will be due on April 20th. We encourage those of you who are interested in this proceeding to file comments. You can do so via our electronic comment filing system, ECFS, and the PowerPoint presentation includes the website for ECFS. You'll need to enter proceeding number 15-53. Again, this is proceeding number 15-53. And Stellar requires us to issue an order in this proceeding by June 2nd, so you should expect to see a decision in the near future. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Diana. Um, Oop, looks like we have a uh, question I made. Let's see. Uh, again, from our uh, friends over at Fairfax County, Virginia. Does the short time period allowed for comments indicate that the notice should be treated as pro forma and the commission has already made up its mind? I could uh, answer that with a resounding no. There are tentative conclusions. Um, as Diana said, the, the actual statute uh, by Congress uh, directing us uh, stellar um, requires that we have an, we actually have an order out by June what? June 2nd. June 2nd. So we have a little tighter, uh, we have a tighter time frame on this. And um, if the uh, commission had fully made up its mind, we wouldn't be uh, having this as a topic today. So we encourage your participation, get your comments and reply comments in the record, and uh, it'll be evaluated. And file your ex partes as well. If you're, right. if you're not able to get something in, uh, by the reply comment deadline, you can certainly feel free to file an ex parte after that date. Yep. And actually, that said, since this is an open proceeding, if you keep your questions more to, um, if you keep them away from, keep them away more, keep them away from the merits of the preceding them themselves and advocating a posi- and advocating a position, then you will not have to file an ex parte. If you do get into the merits and feel you want to advocate a position here, uh, pursuant to our ex parte rules, you'll have to submit an ex parte within two business days. So I'll leave that to your discretion. And let's, uh, well, Dan, Steve. Uh, okay, all our local and state government folks uh, uh, have um, you before them today. I think. Uh, looks like we may have some questions roll in after you exit, as seems to be the case today, but we will get them. We're happy to uh, get back to folks offline, and uh, we thank you for your expertise, and thank you for talking to our state and local governments about um, this issue, which directly impacts them today. Thank you. Okay, I guess uh, that wraps up today's webinar. I had expected a a lot more questions to come uh, flowing in online, but I think the presentation spoke for themselves. I did want to take a a moment to say that while commission decisions may, the outcome, the final outcome may not always be um, uh, to state and local governments liking, I think it's really important that you're part of the process. A lot of the times we, we want to do, the commission wants to do what it can to meet you, uh, meet you halfway, meet you wherever we can uh, to, to come to a mutually beneficial um, decision in our orders, uh, one that you know protects consumers, protects, protects your constituents, and uh, promotes broadband. Uh, whether it's these items or any other items, those are uh, charges we always uh, we always look to public safety, uh, protecting our consumers, and promoting uh, broadband. 
and we really want state and local governments to be part of our process here at the Commission. So please, we always encourage you to file in our items, uh, sign up for our distribution list, and that way you'll get uh, emailed uh, important commission items where, we seek, uh, where we're seeking uh, state and local input, or where we specifically think your input uh, could be uh, valuable to the commission. So thanks, uh, call our office, I'm Gregory Vadis, uh, gregory.vadis at fcc.gov. You could reach out to me or um, any of the folks in my office at the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. You'll find us on the internet. And uh, we'll try as best we can to answer your questions. Um, if not, we'll get you to the right folks at the commission. So thanks again for your time and look forward to working with you.